Welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kitchana Bemitzvotav Kitchana Lansok Pidivrei Torah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And uh, we were talking yesterday. We started um, to talk about um, a sin, a particular sin. The way it was stated in the Torah was said it was saying about all you know uh, contravening all the mitzvot, and uh, it did not mean any mitzvah. Rashi helped us understand, based on rabbinic interpretation, that it's specifically referring to the sin of idolatry, <coughs> which is, excuse me, <coughs> which is uh, e equivalent to all the other mitzvot, because it's foundational, and when you, when you go into idolatry, basically you undermine everything else. So we, we, we're going on with that. The issue here is that it's unintentional. It's a shkaga, or shkia would be a mistake in modern Hebrew. So we're we're going on with this now here. Vechi tishku, and if you err unintentionally, uh, let me see, I want to make sure. No, we did this yesterday, so we're going to go on. Forgive me. I thought I had the place. Right, and we talked about the specific, here we are, the specific offerings that were to be brought. Uh, basically, it was a uh, cow, I think, or a bull, and uh, a bull and a, a uh, I think, a goat. And uh, one was an orla and one was a chatat. And we talked about the specific libations, meal offerings that went along. <clears throat> and we're finishing this up here. And the priest shall atone or make atonement for the entire community of the children of Israel. And they will be forgiven. Because it was in error. It was unintentional. And they brought their offering. A fire offering to Hashem, the Chatatam and their Chatat, and a sin offering, if nay Hashem before God, al Shigagatam, regarding their error. Interestingly, um, let's see. It's, okay, no, we're, we're gonna we're gonna go to the. Let's see if there's Rashi on them. Right. So the the issue they brought their offering. Right. A fire offering. Zeh, so he's saying, what fire offering are they talking about? Zeha Amor Parsha. This is exactly the offerings that were mentioned in this particular Parsha. In other words, back on, on verse 24, who par ha'ola, that would refer to the bull of the ola offering, shenemar ishel Hashem, where it talks about a fire offering, offering for the Lord. The chatatam and their sin offering, zehasair, that's referring to the goat. And uh, let's we'll keep going. So this is a community offering. This is if the community, uh, <clears throat> possibly because of an error in judgment by the leadership of a community, perhaps the Sanhedrin, that rule a particular practice is that that would be considered an idolatrous practice, isn't one. This is based on what we read yesterday uh, in our previous lesson, and but do it out of uh, not intending to do it, but because they erred in a ju in the judgment. And now we get to the verse that is actually said at the very beginning of Kol Nidre. V'nislach l'chol adat b'nei Yisrael, and the entire community of the children of Israel will be forgiven. V'lager hagar v'tocham, including the literally, of course, we say the stranger who resides among them, meaning someone who is not necessarily born as an Israelite. In other words, isn't necessarily a descendant. And I think this is the issue, that they are not necessarily a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because all the entire nation did it in an, as an error, unintentionally. And as I said, this is a verse that's quoted at the beginning of the Kol Nidre service. So the assumption being that if you commit an, this 
out of ignorance, that is not considered the same as knowing and then intentionally doing something wrong. Going on. Uh, yes. Let me make sure I've got the right verse here. Okay. Uh, here we go. The imnefesh achat techeta bishkaga. And if an individual, right, one soul, should sin unintentionally, and Rashi's going to tell us that this is the context of this once again is idolatry, but in now we're talking about an individual, the hikriva a's, and he should uh, offer up a goat, <coughs> excuse me, bachnata, of one year, a yearling goat, the chatat, as a sin offering. So obviously the implications when an individual does it are far less than when the entire community is doing it. So of course the offering is, is uh, much smaller and it's an individual who's bringing this. So let's take a look at the Rashi. Techta bishkaga. So likewise, the avodat kochavim. Here the context is once again idolatry. Ez bat shnata, right? A goat of one year, a yearling goat. Sha'ar averot, so he says, he makes a comment that with regards to other transgressions, yachid mevi kisba, right? The, an individual brings by way of atonement as a sacrifice, kisba, a female calf, or seira, or a female young goat, kid, and regarding this one, he is assigned, right, for this, a seira, a female kid, a female goat. So when it says, uh, when he says, I'm assuming he's talking about this here, um, that he's referring here, that it's only a goat and not a kesev, not a um, calf. Um, here it says lamb and not calf, but I don't know. Okay, maybe you, maybe so. Maybe it's only when it says siri zim that it refers to a goat. But normally... Well, it, it says a lamb or a goat, yeah. in this case a goat. Uh-huh. Okay, good. So it is a goat. Um, normally sin offerings that we know, as I've mentioned before, why a goat is associated with sin offerings, and that has to do with the goat the blood of the goat that the brothers dipped Joseph's coat in when they went to their father and claimed that he had been killed by a wild animal. So in other words, that, that's sort of seen as the uh, watershed for sin, for sin and what's involved there. And possibly from a literary point of view, the, you know, if we think about what they were doing and how painful and awful it really was, uh, given how much Jacob loved Joseph and how they allowed their jealousy to get them to commit a really awful, awful act. So uh, let me keep going. Here we go. Here. And the priest will make atonement for the individual, the soul, literally, which has sinned unintentionally in its sin, bishkaga, unintentionally, in this unintentional sin, lifne Hashem, before Hashem. In other words, the atonement is made before God. So in other words, it's a profound level of atonement. Lechaper alav, to make atonement for him, v'nislachlo, and he will be forgiven. So this, he is absolutely cleansed of this particular sin, when he gets to this point. And the idea, of course, still is that he's done tshuva, even though it doesn't mention it explicitly. But it does elsewhere in another place, I believe in the book of Numbers as well. So, ha'izrach b'vnei Israel, the literally, you know, it's hard to use the term citizen, but we could say, you know, somebody who's born as a Jew or as an Israelite, and someone who's converted to Judaism. And that's how we translate it, at least in a modern sense. Torah achat yelachem 
you shall have one teaching, one law, one provision. For one who does this in, by mistake, or unintentionally, I should say, a little bit clearer. <clears throat> now we're going to go to another level. So literally it means the individual who does this uh, literally in a, with a high hand, in other words, intentionally. They know it's wrong, they know what they're doing is wrong, and they still do it. Minha is rough, whether they're a born Israelite or Minha Ger, or whether they are one who has attached themselves to uh, the Israelites or the Jewish people. Et Hashem hu Megadev. He reviles God. This is an act, clear act of attempting to revile God. Venichreta, in that case, Venichreta Hanefesh Hahi Nikeruv Ama. That soul will be, the way we translate it, is cut off from the midst of her, her, her nefesh is feminine, of her people, of her nation, etc. So let's see if we have any rushing on this. Here we are. Biyad Rama, and he says clearly, the Mezid, and that's the opposite of Shkaka. In other words, with full knowledge and consciousness to act uh, to worship idols. Megadev, again, translating this word, means to revile or to blaspheme. Mecharef, to shame, kamo, and he gives examples in Ezekiel chapter 5. Vahaita cherpa ugdufa, and she will be a shame and a um, and reviled, right? And from Isaiah uh, 37, Asher Gadfu, there's that verb again, Naare Melachash Ashur, whom the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled. The Odashu Rabotainu Mikan and our rabbis, in addition, interpreted or, or inferred the Mevarech et Hashem, that one who curses, but we don't want to say curse. So this is an example of euphemism. So literally it means bless Hashem, but it actually means to curse Hashem. One who curses God, Shehu Bakarit, that that particular act, the punishment for that is karet, is excision. And he gives the references there. Uh, let's keep going. Okay. Kidvar Hashem Baza, because he has scorned, he's despised the word of Hashem. Just finishing up the sentence here. For it at mitzvah to hefar and has invalidated his commandments. He karate, he tikaret. So this is an emphatic. Emphatic. He shall surely be cut off. Soul shall be. I didn't get that. Could you try again? That soul will be cut off. I'm gonna do something here to try and see what I can do to prevent that from happening. Let's see if that'll work. No, it just thought you were evoking her because you must have said something that sounded similar. It must have sounded like Siri, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or artificial intelligence, apparently, right? Hikare, uh, tikare, it shall surely be cut off. Anefeshahi, that soul, that individual, avona ba, her her iniquity is within her. And this little, these two words actually create a something to prevent us from thinking, well, that's the final, final statement, that if one does this intentionally, that's the end of the story. That's the punishment, and that's it. But that's not how the rabbis interpret it. They see that those additional words as actually giving you an out clause, excuse me. Okay. So, Dvar Hashem, the word of Hashem, Azharat Avodat Kochavim. So, this is a <clears throat> literally, you could say, a warning, but it's a negative commandment. 
right? It is, it is a warning against the worship of idols. So what he's pointing out is the style of the Torah here. That, uh, that this, in other words, these words here are as if it were a quotation from God. And the remainder parts of this are, are what Moses added. So here, this part here, these first ones, etc., is as it were directly from God. And then this key, Dvar Hashem Baza, for notice God is referred to in the third person, and, um, and that this is Moses explaining what's going on. That he that uh, that uh, in in blaspheming, it is actually tantamount to uh, despising God's word. Let's go on with this. I believe there's a little more Rashi. Yes, here we go. Those last two words, Avona ba, its iniquity is within it. In other words, within that individual. So he says, Bizman. So what this is coming to take tell you is that this applies as long as the person is continuing to do this kind of act. Meaning that he hasn't done tshuva. He hasn't repented and regretted what he's done. So we see here the incredible power of repentance. And, and maybe gives us a little bit more of an insight as to the whole notion of Yom Kippur and what it's supposed to mean. And the idea of people retracting their bad behavior. And again, this is something we just need to look around us and see what's going on. So this is actually the end of this particular section. We now will be finishing up this parsha with a little bit of a narration all right, so I'll, I'll keep going because we do have a little bit more time, but I will continue. So, by you, Bnei Yisrael Bamibar, so a new, new paragraph. The children of Israel were in the Midbar, in the wilderness. And they discovered a, an individual gathering sticks on Shabbat, on Shabbat. So, so we don't have too many examples of what it is to violate Shabbat. We we basically infer the whole principle of 39 main categories of labor um, <clears throat> from verses connected with the construction of the tabernacle, where Shabbat is mentioned in those contexts. And I believe we've discussed this. <clears throat> Excuse me. But here we have an example of an activity that is considered forbidden on Shabbat. So, uh, the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they discovered, right? So, Bignutan Shel Yisrael Tiber Hakatuv. He says, Scripture is speaking negatively regarding, uh, in other words, the humiliation of the Jewish people or the Israelites. This is the context of the statement. In what sense? Because the only Shabbat that they actually observed was the very first Shabbat, Uvashnia, and in the second, already the second Shabbos, Ba uh, This individual came, and Chilala means to desecrate the Shabbat, not consider it something special. <clears throat> Going on. And the people who found him gathering sticks brought him near El Moshe to Moses. They brought him to Moses, the El Aharon, and to Aaron, the El Kol Haida, and to the entire community. So when it says entire community, uh, my understanding is they're talking basically about the uh, 70 elders that Moses had uh, been asked to put together to help him make a judgment. And that, that symbolically, in a way, is before everyone. In other words, that this wasn't done privately. It was done in a public kind of way. That's, I think, the point of this. 
Hametziim Oto Mekoshesh. So again, this seems to be an unnecessary paragraph. Uh, it seemed, or rather, forgive me, phrase would seem that that's pretty obvious. So here we go. So we get from this Shehit Rubo that because what they did, <coughs> excuse me, this is something that's required in terms of uh, a, a halachic uh, imposition of, uh, of capital punishment, that there has to be no shadow of doubt that this person is doing it with full intention. And the way in which you determine that is that two people to forewarn that individual that what they are doing is, in fact, a capital offense. And that so that there's no question as to whether or not that person was doing it again unintentionally, right? And he did not cease from doing it, and he didn't cease from gathering sticks. And that's why it's talking about they found that he was gathering sticks, meaning he continued to gather it, gather sticks up. Mi shemats uhu, even though they had discovered him, they found him doing that. The he trubo, and they forewarned him. It was done with complete intention to violate the Shabbat. and they placed him uh, under guard, so to speak. So he was put. I, you know, I'm going to use. Um, you know, a, a phrase that doesn't really apply, but they put him in jail, right? They put him under guard. Kilo for rush, because it had not been explic explicitly stated, ma ye aselo, what should be done to him. They didn't know exactly what the punishment was supposed to be. So, Rashi, Kilo for rush, ma ye it had not been explained or explicitly stated. What should be done to him? Again, Sifre, Sanhedrin, these are the references. Lo hayu yodim, what they didn't know, the ezemita yamut, what kind of capital punishment should be meted out to him? They knew it was a capital offense, that they knew already. They just didn't know what capital offense. Aval yodim hayu, but indeed they were aware. Shahamechalel. Shabbat Bamita. They did know that, in fact, that someone who desecrates the Shabbat has committed a capital offense. And I think part of, you know, the way in which we ourselves can look at this, because it sounds, of course, incredibly harsh, but I think what we're supposed to understand is that <coughs> it is something serious. Sorry, was there a question? Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, all right, uh, so I think we can go on here with the next sentence. So they, they came to Moses and they consulted with Moses as to what exactly was to be done, what kind of capital punishment. And Hashem said to Moses, This man shall certainly be put to death. And the specific punishment is to take my message. Sorry. Kol ha'eda. They should pelt him with stones. Kol ha'eda. The entire community. Michutz la'machane. Outside the camp. So, let's see what... <coughs> make sure. Okay. Ragom. So, this, this particular grammatical form is what Rashi's commenting on. He says, "Asse." In other words, it's an imperative. And I believe, if my French is good enough here, it would be like faisant. And, la, and fair, F-A-I-R-E in French means to do, right? Belaz. And here he says, steinigent, right? And I think that actually is stoning. Vechein haloch, and again, this particular way in which to set up a verb, haloch, ragom, right? So, ayant, right? From ale in French, to go. Vechein zachor, veshamor. Those are, are imperative 
forms, at least I would consider them imperative, although it's sounding uh, more like a participle. So, uh, and maybe they're closer, they're actually closer in the, in sense. So the entire community took him out of the camp. And again, it's not that I think all, you know, 600,000 plus were doing this, but rather that the leaders, the the high court was doing this, seeing that this was done. And he was uh, stoned, right, with stones, and he died just as God had commanded Moses. They took him outside the camp. Mikan, and here we go. From this we learn that the, the place where they used to perform the stoning had to be a, a, diff, a distance outside and a distance from the court, from the court. And the idea here, as I recollect from studying Sanhedrin, is that it gave them the opportunity to see if there was any possible reason to take him back and try him, because they wanted to go to the ultimate extent as far as they could, not to wind up actually killing somebody, actually uh, sentencing someone ultimately to capital punishment. And so they would give him an opportunity to see if there was some defense that this person could mount. And that's one reason why, so that that, that was done in a very deliberate kind of way. So uh, this we do end though on a positive note and we will have to do that next time. So I'm going to stop the share here and uh, put in the mark and the maftir. And I'm going to stop here. Let's see if I, can do this. I have a question. Yes. Uh, sometimes if you own a business or you work for somebody and you have to work on Saturday, uh, there you go. Uh, you're, disgr you're disgracing the Shabbos. I don't know. It's it's hard for because the competition is so keen. Uh, you know the Christians don't consider Saturday a Shabbos, and if you don't, if your store is not open, they'll go other places. The same way, if you're working for somebody and he says you got to work on Saturday or I'll, I'll let you go, it's a problem. It is. So Harlan, uh, this is the way I would explain it, and hopefully I'm not hopefully I'm not giving a false interpretation. We are reading, we are reading written law, and we know that along with written law, and very importantly, we have something called oral law, okay? And remember, the theme of oral law is circumstances alter cases, right? And you have to consider the circumstance, and is this something you would be doing if you had a choice? And so the way I think you have to do this is by limiting the amount of work that you're doing and trying to be conscious of the Shabbat and, and being sure you're not doing this biyad rama. You're not doing this in a way to, you know, to declare that you don't believe in God. You're doing it because you believe that your livelihood is dependent on it. Now, I know that there are people who will go to the extent of selling their businesses and making sure they don't gain any profit from that particular day, that work, okay? I mean, there are ways to get around it, but they are relatively extreme. And I think that the basic way in which one does this so that it isn't done bemezid, it isn't done intentionally, is to, to limit it to what you absolutely have to do. Did you know a uh, Rabbi Adler, Moshe Adler, who was at the of Minnesota? I did. I did. So he I he did. used to come down to Carleton once in a while because we didn't have a rabbi or then. Yes. Right. So he'd visit us when I was a student there. And he said, you know, some kids had classes on Shabbat. And he'd say, if you can avoid signing up for a class that meets on Shabbat, avoid it. If you can't, yeah. um, you know, make it different somehow. Like I agree. Yeah. It choose a choose a pen that you're going to use to take notes in that class. Right. Uh and use that pen only for that. And then when the course is over, throw it away. 
there we go. Right. I mean, you find ways to to be still observing Shabbat. That's what you do. That's what you can. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks well, for sharing that, Shira Beth.